And so to sit there and know, be a, a knowing and willing participant in an administration that is engaging in a genocide that's killed 25,000 plus people, innocent people, 11,000 plus of whom are children, stories about people getting amputations, children getting amputations without any anesthetic, babies being cut out of their mother's womb who've been killed in sniper attacks and being saved in an ICU unit, which God knows how that's even running on a wing and a prayer. You know, you you have an obligation to make clear what the options are in this election. And instead of, by the way, immediately endorsing Biden the day he announced his campaign or within a couple of days, if I recall correctly, you could have said, look, I know that I was obviously that was before October 7th, but it wasn't before the uh, 75 years of occupation in Palestine. Right. So there right. was an, uh, an obligation, I would argue, for you to have been making a call for other candidates to get into the race or to get behind one of the more progressive candidates that had already announced. And so you were complicit. You don't get to just hold yourself at arm's length and say, hey, I'm in it, but not of it. That's just not how it works. Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. We were told we had to vote for Joe Biden to stave off another four years of Trump because Trump is the worst. All my life, that's what I've been told. I have to vote Democrat because the other guy is the worst case scenario. But what happens when the lesser evil is responsible for the worst case scenario? Joe Biden is facilitating a genocide in Gaza. Genocide is as bad as it gets. Is the Democrats vote blue no matter who gun to our heads tactic going to work this time around? If Biden loses, Will they blame Arab voters for refusing to vote for a man who's demonstrated he doesn't see them as fully human? Or perhaps they'll blame the left again. Or maybe it'll be Susan Sarandon's fault, like they said back in 2016. There's always the China or Russia scapegoat. How come there's never any introspection? How come when so much of the country supports a ceasefire, this attitude is barely reflected among our elected officials? Why does the Democratic Party in particular refuse to budge on Israel, despite its base becoming increasingly pro-Palestine? Why are they willing to risk an election over it? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by Brianna Joy Gray, host of Bad Faith Podcast and co-host of Rising at the Hill. But before we jump into it, this is just the first part of this episode. The full interview is available to Breakthrough News members only. You can become a member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news. And as always, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can also donate below on YouTube. Brianna, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Ron. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Well, I'm so happy to have you on. It's uh, I think I remember when you had me on your show, you were like, it's I can't believe I haven't had you on yet. And I feel the it same way. <laughs> it was nuts. And I selfishly want to have you on over and over and over again for two reasons. One, because you're one of the best, um, most cogent, knowledgeable, um, you know, coherent voices, particularly on what's going on in the Middle East. And two, because it is like painfully difficult to find female guests. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, I hear you. Oh, my. I'd struggle with this, too. I and I look at the lineup and it's like, I have some sympathy for folks who've gotten, you know, dinged in the past for not having more kind of gender diversity on their shows. Because yeah. every week I'm like, who's, who's the woman version of this, this expert for this subject. And yeah. I think so many of the women in this space happen to have their own shows and very busy schedules themselves that like, I can't endlessly make demands of you and Katie and Crystal just to keep like a rotating you know, <laughs> shift on each other's show. So I know I'm going to do better. And if people have folks in mind, I always appreciate recommendations. But anyway, it's a long way of saying cool. I have an extra level of appreciation for you. Well, I appreciate that. And the feeling super mutual. And it is it is a struggle. And I think it's because like so much of the political commentary analysis journalism field is just, you know, oversaturated with men, like a lot of fields where it takes like a lot of boldness. Um, yeah. So it can be difficult to find outspoken women. They exist. They definitely exist, but they're pushed down to the bottom so much as you and I both know, because you have to kind of claw your way into spaces. Um, but I'm happy to have you on. I'm happy to have two women talking here. And there's so much I want to talk to you about. Uh, and, you know, we're going to be going a bit into the Democratic Party and what's happening with the upcoming election related to the genocide in Gaza. But, you know, I, I've really appreciated 
everything you've been saying, um, all the shows you've been doing on this issue. You've been so outspoken on what's happening in Gaza, even in some spaces where I know it's not entirely easy to be. Um, so I, I want to open by just asking you on a personal level, um, what was your kind of evolution introduction into this issue? You know, is this something, is Palestine something you've kind of always understood? Or is it something that you maybe later understood when you got in more into politics? And if so, how? Tell me about that. That's interesting. I don't, I mean, I do think that there's, it's always been the case. Um, I lived abroad during my youth. My mother worked for the United Nations uh, growing up. And I think because of her experiences, for example, um, being sent to evacuate UN staff from Lebanon, feeling personally uh, threatened by IDF missiles as they were told, oh, you're safe to evacuate, but they're seeing bombs go off around them, you know, holding the hands of her Palestinian colleagues as they talk about what their families have been through. I mean, it has always been a conscious issue in my life without having to learn it in a more academic way. But certainly, I think like most folks, even who consider themselves leftist, there was a lot more ambivalence in talking about the issue because we do get hit with these narratives that it's so complicated, it's a third rail, you don't want to cross certain lines. And I remember having Mark Lamont Hill on Bad Faith Podcast a couple of years ago. You know, he's wrote that book about um, the le leftist being progressive except for Palestine and how it really is this third rail. And obviously he had the experience of being fired from, uh, what was it, CNN? Yeah. Uh, four statements he made at the United Nations that got characterized as, wanting uh, to wipe Israel off the map when you say from the river to the sea or what have you. And so even when he and I were having that conversation, him being someone who was so much more knowledgeable and someone who was so much more confident, I remember feeling, feeling a little stilted and awkward because both of us were still going way out of our way to avoid the third rail. <laughs> and it's frankly yeah. been really heartening for me to see how much more freedom, um, rhetorical freedom and confidence that folks, including myself, have gained just in the last few months because of the exigency of what's going on in Gaza. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, you know, I that's I, that's also really interesting about your mom. I had no idea you have like this connection to I assume that's probably in the 80s when Israel oh, no. Lebanon or when or no, 2006. No, in 2006. I don't even know. Six? Which yeah. time? I'm like, which time would yeah, Israel no, no, no. bomb Lebanon? <laughs> no, it's so hard. I got in that, you know, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm like, uh, uh, yeah, that would be like, a, but no, that, that's really, that's really interesting. I mean, 2006 was quite a devastating time for Lebanon, but that's, I mean, yeah, I mean, having personal family connection to that can really be eye-opening, but also I, I'm curious, you know, you just, you just speaking about you and Mark Lamont Hill having a conversation and I watched your conversation and I, I really liked it, but I'm just curious, you know, obviously you're coming at this as a black American woman and there is a tendency uh, among Israel's most you know, ardent supporters in the U.S. to try to attack people of color with the anti-Semite label in a more vicious way than they do others. I mean, I've as a, as growing up Arab in the U.S., I've experienced that a lot. Yeah. Just constant displacing of blame for the Holocaust, which you know, I should I want to take every opportunity I can to yeah, remind people course. that white Europeans committed of the course. Holocaust. Of course, but it gets this this anti-Semitism that's historically very European Christian. Uh, white gets displaced on people of color a lot. So I'm just curious, like how you've had to deal with that, because I do see how you get attacked and it does come at you much more viciously than it does somebody like our very good friend, Katie Halper, for example. Yeah, it's interesting. I Katie's in an interesting position as are many um, pro-Palestinian advocates who are Jewish. There's a different kind of attack they get that is visceral in different kind of ways, I would yeah. say. There's a lot of, um, it's almost sometimes I think it's fierier and more uh, more visceral because they feel like you're, you know, you, they get called self-hating Jew yeah, and traitors. you know better. <laughs> and you know, it was a different character of response. I wouldn't say it was necessarily lesser because I've seen some real vitriol directed <laughs> yeah. at, at Jewish people. And, 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 and I've had, I've had relationships with, you know, kind of maybe let's call them progressive, but for Palestine Jewish leftists who are much madder at like a Katie type than me because they think, mm. well, Brianna, you're just silly. You don't know. You don't know any better. You'll learn someday. Whereas Katie, they feel, or, or someone like Katie, they'll feel like, what's wrong with you? You know, you're yeah. not a, re you know, there's something intrinsically wrong with you. I will say though that I think that there's been a real response, particularly against Black Americans, because there's been a longstanding history of solidarity between Black Americans and Palestinians. Um, I had a guest on uh, who is a uh, 
scholar of Jewish studies at Dartmouth recently, who was talking about the evolution of the relationship between blacks and Jews in the United States and really interrogating this idea that there was a break that happened in the 60s that was an I ideological in nature, as opposed to a break that happened because the solidarity was rooted in both uh, in leftist Jews and leftist blacks, both being communists and socialists and having a um, internationalist view of the world and seeing Israel as a, a kind of settler colonial project. And what happened when there was more assimilation among American Jews into mainstream American society and their politics simply shifted into a more liberal style of politics. And that was the cause of the break as opposed to any actual values or um, difference of, of just, just for difference of opinion between the races on the question of Israel. Um, it was really about a broader ideological kind of left versus liberalism divide. And so I'm really interested in those kind of questions, but also really interested in tracking the history of kind of a consistent black understanding, leftist black understanding of why uh, the rights of Palestinians are so important and linked to our own historical trajectory of the United States and the trajectory of so many disenfranchised people around the world. And so I think knowing that and seeing that there has been an effort to attack black allies or whatever you want to call them in particular, you see this with the discourse around college campuses, like how dare these black groups be in solidarity with um, pro-Palestine groups. You see this in the way that DEI is lumped into the critique of the pro-Palestinian uh, protesters. You saw this really early on with the Deborah Messings of the world saying things like, we stood up for you and Black Lives Matter and now look what you're doing to us. Like a real effort to corral the horses and act, and act as though, um, you know, as two oppressed groups, we should be standing together instead of asking the question about whether or not as two oppressed groups, we should be standing together along with the third oppressed group, the Palestinians, and who right. really is betraying the once shared ideology, who who is the one that's forgetting that we're supposed to never forget, as opposed to recharacterizing it as we'll, we'll never forget, we'll never repeat this for Jewish people as opposed to for anybody at all in the world. Yeah, and gosh, for Deb Deborah Mess. I mean, was Deborah Messing? I don't. I'm sorry. I I could be wrong, Brianna. But do, do was she at the forefront of those 2020 protests? Did uh, I miss that? <laughs> not that I recall. You know, I didn't see her there. I'm not just kidding. Um, I mean, I'm just saying. Was, who, who was it that said? Oh, it was um, it was one of those. Uh, was it um. Was it Jim Clyburn? Somebody back in, do you remember that in 2016, they were talking about Bernie Sanders and civil rights protests and one of the, you know, uh, you know, the, the really legendary black electeds who, you know, marched across Edmund Pettit's bridge threw Bernie in the bus and was like, well, I never saw him on, I never saw him at any protests. So he must not have been a participant. In any civil rights <laughs> so that was a, that was a deep callback. I don't really mean to suggest that if I didn't personally see Deborah Messing at a, at a protest, no, no, she no, must fair. have been there. But the idea that she, Juliana Margulies was another one of these ones that specifically said, um, do you remember that clip? It was, I don't want to mischaracterize it because it's going to sound like I made it up because it was, the real thing was so bad. Oh, oh it she's the, okay, no, no, that. she's the woman from, I know who you're talking about. She's the woman from The Good Wife. Yes. Who exactly. I had no idea was like a psychotic right winger, apparently. <laughs> is she a right winger? Or is it just on well, this issue? Well, she sounds like one. She sounds like one on this issue. Like what she said was so insane. And as someone who plays... Uh, a lesbian journalist on the morning show. I'm, I'm more offended by it as a lesbian than I am as a Jew, to be honest with you, because I want to say to them, you fucking idiots. You don't exist. Like you're even lower than the Jews. A, you're black and B, you're gay. And you're turning your back against the people who support you. So to be clear, she's not lesbian. <laughs> but as someone who she played a lesbian, lesbian on TV, wait, wait. <laughs> she's like embarrassing. She, she's extremely offended by like black queer people, I guess, uh, standing in solidarity with Palestinian hum humanitarian rights. So here we are. That is so. I I know. I remember seeing that. That was like a month or so ago, maybe a little bit yeah. more. And yeah. I remember seeing that and thinking, oh, I liked The Good Wife. That's unfortunate. Um, and also, I didn't know she was in the next season of The Morning Show because I haven't really been able to watch TV for the past few months. Uh, cause I've just been like too obsessed too with busy. Gaza. Yeah. And on top of that, I was like, is she speaking? I'm confused. Is she speaking for, for lesbians or is she speaking for Jewish people? Or She is unironically speaking for lesbians because she plays, uh, Reese Witherspoon's love interest in the latest season of the morning show. And apparently black people need to listen to her. I'm still, 
<laughs> it's no, it's been it's, it's been incredibly embarrassing to watch like people like her, people like Amy Schumer, people like Deborah Messing. Um, not that I'm surprised, but it's just so crazy. I'm like, do you hear yourself? Do you hear yourself? It's 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 stunning. But I do want to ask you, you know, I think you might maybe you have insight into this, maybe you don't, but I'd still love to get your at least take on it. You know, you were the press secretary for Bernie Sanders. Um, and you know, I was a big Bernie Sanders supporter. I've been unbelievably disappointed um yep. in a way where i'm just like this is unforgivable uh in bernie sanders's refusal to call for a ceasefire um i mean i know he's been doing other stuff he's been trying to promote this bill to uh condition aid to israel military aid to israel on i'm not really sure what like i don't know israel has to stop killing as many people i'm actually well right there's a pre-existing law that says that we're not supposed to give america's not supposed to give aid to anyone who's committing humanitarian rights abuses i think it's called the leary law the healy i think it's the leary law. law yeah okay and he's simply asking for it to be enforced and then he tried this right. other thing that didn't work uh where they were, he wanted there to be some congressional review on the prospect of human rights uh, uh, violations. Just let's look into it. Not saying we're going to do anything about it just yet. Just might we consider taking a gander before we uh, uh, approve a, another multi-billion dollar aid, aid package to Israel? Yeah. And of course, as you well know, that didn't fly either. So yeah, you're right. He has been doing things which are, I think, meaningful, not just gestures, but meaningful efforts to create some accountability in this process and to put some obstacles up between the United States and its funding of Israel and providing of weapons to Israel as it commits uh, a genocide. But the fact that he's willing to do that and walk right up to the line without saying the words, I want a ceasefire, it's difficult to understand. It's truly bizarre. And it makes it seem pretty obvious that there's some kind of red line that's been drawn internally uh, among Democrats within the Biden administration, whatever you want to, however you want to characterize it, where people have been pressured pretty significantly not to cross that particular line. And it, it is difficult to understand. I can't claim to have made sense of it. Yeah, I mean, I remember, I don't remember where, but I think I saw James Zogby, maybe it was on Democracy Now! or something, say like, he was like, he's not taking my calls. I've tried reaching out to him, he's not taking my calls. And I do remember back in 2016, um, I wasn't a huge fan of Bernie Sanders at first, because back in 2014, when Israel was doing Operation Protective Edge, I think it was called, um, Bernie Sanders, there was like a town hall he was having in Vermont and a bunch that. of his people from his constituency were like calling for a ceasefire and he had them kicked out. Mm -hmm. And I was like, who the, I was like, who the hell is this guy? I wasn't familiar with Bernie Sanders at the time. So I was like, who the hell is this old white senator? Mm -hmm. And so I like held a grudge, you know, and then it came to 2016 and everybody was so excited. And I was like, nope, I don't care. This guy sucks on Palestine. And then I remember he like brought on Cornell West and then I remember he like started shifting what he was saying and listening to people. And then I still remember that really like iconic moment in Brooklyn when him and Hillary Clinton had a debate. And I mean, he said something really basic. He was like, you know, Hillary Clinton said something so disgusting, something like Hamas dresses in civilian clothing, the clothing so that when they die, like or when they get killed by the Israelis, like uh, they get counted as civilians, like something disgusting like that. And Bernie Sanders like took issue with it. And he told her like, you know, no Palestinians are human beings and they're deserving of basic rights. And I remember the the whole like room just erupted in applause and cheers. And I was like, holy crap, like this guy's awesome. Yeah. And he's going on Jake Tapper. And he's like, he's like, how are you going to call me an anti-Semite? Like my parents, like, like they like fled pogroms, like what? And it just didn't work. And he was really good. I was like amazed and he yeah. stayed pretty good on it. So this time I'm just like, what on earth is happening? Yeah. Well, well I, I think, think it's also, go ahead, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I'm well, sorry. Go I was ahead. just going to bring it to like, I think it's also, you know, maybe it's a democratic party thing. Maybe mm -hmm. it's like a problem among our progressive leadership things. I don't know. That's all I was going to say, but go ahead, take it from there. Well, no, it, it, I think part of it is that the, uh, Overton window has shifted so radically to the left that there was a time in 2016 where all you have to say is uh, Palestinians are people too. Mm -hmm. And you can get a room full of applause. But it's a good thing that we have been inching, creeping toward, I think, a better collective understanding of the crisis, um, the ongoing crisis of the occupation, not just the more immediate post October 7th siege crisis. And as a consequence, he has found himself on the wrong side 
of where most people are. I think, I don't know that he moved so much that the world moved around him. And I don't think it was necessarily wrong to give him credit for being ahead of the curve at one point in time. But we are also confronted with a stark reality that now he's very much behind the curve. I mean, back in 2008, it felt like a breath of fresh air for um, John McCain to say to that heckler who said Obama's a Muslim and is bad, right. well, it's okay to be Muslim, right? Like yeah. that felt like, oh my God, g- give him a civil rights hero prize. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was the environment at the time. And you know, obviously a lot of people were like, that's the bare minimum, even then. But the, the point is, you know, I, I it's, it continues to be disappointing just because he's an older guy, I don't think excuses him not moving with the times as they're shifting, especially since because he's ostensibly toward the end of his political career. It does seem like the stakes of him doing the right thing in this moment are low. You see so many of advisors, Matt, people like Matt mm-hmm. Duss are increasingly critical of the Biden administration online. We can all agree that they're not doing so enough, but like you can see the people that are around him be sharper and sharper in their criticism, even people like um, Rokana. And so the question becomes, why is what is Bernie holding out for? Like, what what is it? What is he being? Pre- how is he being pressured in this moment to go right up to the line and say everything but for the word cease, ceasefire? It's yeah, no, it's, it's it's a good question. And I, I wish I knew the answer, but I do feel like at least from where I'm sitting, um, it looks to me like Bernie Sanders is no longer the leader. And if he ever was, I mean, I guess he was kind of the figurehead of something on the left for some time. And I feel like that era so has now ended what? with this <laughs> um, and it really. Yeah. So now what? So I didn't hear a way. And that's a good question. So now what? And before we get to like the squad, I want to ask you. You know, what are your thoughts on, and I mean, I guess this is a very progressive except for Palestine, but also John Fetterman. I mean, John Fetterman has been like, you know, Netanyahu practically in the way he's been talking about this, which has been really shocking because for a moment he seemed like, oh, the new it guy on the progressive side of things. And like, he was your working class working man, though I no, recently learned wealthy that he's actually not family. He went from to the Harvard, like, <laughs> yeah. It's extremely it's like cosplaying. Cosplay. Very effective, um, apparently, cosplay. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I think all, yeah, go ahead. I'd love to hear well, your I thoughts had, on John um, Fetterman. Nathan Robinson on a Bad Faith podcast for the Monday episode this week. And he, remember, got a lot of flack from folks on the left because during the, uh, the campaign, uh, the senatorial campaign, he was calling out Fetterman staff for focusing too much on kind of online antics, playing into all the discourse about Dr. Oz not being from Philadelphia while being, or from Pennsylvania, while being really light on the substance of what John Fetterman actually stood for. And I think a lot of people at the time thought, well, Nathan, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. This kind of viral Gen Z TikTok fun dunking on the internet is working for Fetterman. Fetterman's our guy. What do you want Dr. Oz to be, Senator? Just like take the, take the W. And now at this point, it is worth reflecting on whether or not we should have been more circumspect, not just because of the online nature of the campaign, which I don't think is a problem in and of itself, but by the fact that it wasn't accompanied by more substance and that we didn't get more clarity, perhaps because of the success of the online antics about what Fetterman actually really stood for. Now, there's also an argument that says, well, what do you do about it? Um, Assuming that we're past the primary process, if it is Fetterman and Oz, we're, we're in one of these situations again where are we saying vote blue no matter who because the alternative is worse? Is the calculation of vote blue no matter who different when it's a Senate race as opposed to a national um, electoral race, a, a presidential race? Um, are we willing to bite the bullet and bend the knee so that the, who, the eventual president has the votes in the Senate to perhaps enact important policy changes that are, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, these are difficult questions, but I certainly think Nathan's insight is worth reflecting on in retrospect. Definitely. Yeah. And then you look at the squad, which I mean, to be fair to the squad, I mean, what Rashida Tlaib was subjected to was really horrible. And like they rallied around her when she was. But then I haven't hear, heard anything from them since. And this is ongoing. Um, I'm not sure what they've been doing. I mean, I think that they've called for ceasefires individually. I know that they've held a couple like sort of photo ops outside of the Capitol, but they've sort of disappeared on this issue. And so it just becomes like, what do they matter if in this situation they have no power 
to put any pressure on anyone anywhere and have literally just kind of yeah i mean i don't know if you saw it. there was a recent clip um of aoc on um this kind of fun podcast that's gone viral with these two um ladies two blonde ladies and like they're i don't want to guess people's ages but like maybe 40s or 50s and they kind of have like a like southern lady sitting on my front porch dishing kind of vibe about them just kind of talking trash about people but they're unexpectedly kind of funny and unexpectedly kind of progressive to the extent that you might stereotype them for being southern white ladies you know um and so they had uh, AOC <laughs> on and they asked her in this clip that's been going around I think Glenn Greenwald just tweeted it out if you want to take a look at it, look at it um whether or not they're like team Biden if, if she's team Biden at the end of the day, they're like, well, he's getting all this pushback on a lot of stuff, but like, are you ultimately team Biden? And she says, yes, I am. Um, and kind of makes a sort of a vote blue no matter who argument. So that's where ASC is. Um, wow. That's where ASC is. Jamal Bowman, I know, recently caught some fire on Twitter for distancing himself from Norm Finkelstein. Uh, either he was on a show uh, that had hosted him or was at an event where he was affiliated and some um, Zionist online folks were criti criticizing him for that. And so he he said, I had no idea about uh, Norm Finkelstein's past. You know, there's a whole group of people that will accuse uh, Professor uh, Dr. Finkelstein of being a Holocaust denier, despite his parents so obviously survi surviving the Holocaust. So, <laughs> so, I mean, that's that's the kind of stuff I'm hearing out of them right now. And I, I completely echo your sympathies and compassion for Rashida Tlaib specifically, and also Ilhan Omar as the two Muslim women of Congress who have been really getting it. And Rashida, I mean, I can't even begin to imagine what this experience has been like her on a, for her on a personal level. Um, but it doesn't feel like she has very much support within her party, even frankly, within the squad. Yeah, I just sorry. I really I pulled up this clip that you were talking about. Yeah. I'm not going to play all five minutes, but I think I'm hoping that the beginning of this like um, is a part. I, I, I've actually never seen these women. This is interesting. An interesting yeah. setup. They got AOC on. So let, let's hear what uh what they had to what she had to say here. Had it or hit it. Joe Biden hit it. You know, honestly, here's the thing. I think sometimes people want electoral politics to be, we overly identify with, it's like, if you vote for someone, they have to be the embodiment of you. And that's actually something that I think Donald Trump provided to a lot of people where it's like, if you voted for him and if you were a Donald Trump person, like you, you want, like it, it symbolized so much, but I think, what we have here in this situation is a more just honest thing. There are plenty of things that the president does that I completely disagree with. Um, I think, you know, right now what's happening in Gaza, I can't, I, I just, I, I can't go on every single day seeing this. I don't associate myself with what's happening. But at the end of the day, um, we have to acknowledge that we we just can't allow this fascist movement to grow in this country. And what I think is actually hopeful about our politics is that we can exist outside of electoral politics in organizing our communities and standing with our friends. And, you know, if it's coming down to this next election, for me personally, the decision to vote is not a difficult one for me um, because like, just because I'm voting for him doesn't mean that he embodies everything about me. Right. Um, so that to me is where I'm at. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's, people are gonna get mad on the internet because that's what they do. But I think we just gotta be adults about the situation wow. and realize like, that electoral politics is just one, it's just one sm small sliver of how we make the world better. And if we put all of our eggs into that basket, people start acting way too crazy. And like, Okay, I get what she's saying, but here's the thing, like, and I'd love your take on this too, because that's the first time I'm seeing that. She's not just some person. 
Mm-hmm. She's not just some voter, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's actually an okay, like that's a fair argument she made. I don't necessarily disagree. If somebody, that's someone's opinion. If they're like, I don't agree with him on Gaza, still going to vote for the guy. All right, go vote for him. That's totally fine. I agree with you. Electoral politics is just one of many things. You are a sitting member mm-hmm. of Congress. Why on earth are you just giving away your support that way? Mm-hmm. Like you actually have some leverage mm-hmm. and you're just not going to use this. Sorry, you're just nodding. A lot. Please go ahead. No, I think that that's spot on. She's talking about electoral politics just being a tiny sliver of what's going on and how it's not that important. Your entire reason of being famous <laughs> is that you are the beneficiary of electoral politics. And the argument that you all made was that you're going to vote for me. We're going to go into Congress. We're going to shake things up from the inside. We're going to do an adversarial style of politics. That was literally the purpose of Justice Democrats as an organization. But they got elected and immediately started talking about how we're not going to vote as a block. We're not really a squad that was just a branding exercise that a magazine did one time that took off. And so to sit there and know, be a, a knowing and willing participant in an administration that is engaging in a genocide that's killed 25,000 plus people, innocent people, 11,000 plus of whom are children, stories about people getting amputations, children getting amputations without any anesthetic, babies being cut out of their mother's womb who've been killed in sniper attacks and being saved in an ICU unit, which God knows how that's even running on a wing and a prayer. You know, you you have an obligation to make clear what the options are in this election. And instead of, by the way, immediately endorsing Biden the day he announced his campaign or within a couple of days, if I recall correctly, you could have said, look, I know that I was obviously that was before October 7th, but it wasn't before the uh, 75 years of occupation in Palestine. Right. So there right. was an, uh, an obligation, I would argue, for you to have been making a call for other candidates to get into the race or to get behind one of the more progressive candidates that had already announced. And so you were complicit. You don't get to just hold yourself at arm's length and say, hey, I'm in it, but not of it. That's just not how it works. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's, just, it's utterly shocking and it's really just throwing it in. Like, I don't, I mean, also, she's in a district where, like, what are you even afraid of? You're popular in your district. You're going to win your reelection. It's just so unbelievably ignorant. But I don't know if it is. I don't know. I I don't know if she's just ambitious. I don't know what's in her heart. I really don't. But it's it's very I'm like really trying to restrain my my like my anger about this because it feels very personal for me. Right. Like, I can imagine every like I live in a country that every day the Israelis are like, hey, we're going to turn you back to the Stone Age. And also like 200 miles from where I live, there's a genocide happening to people that I feel I'm like are my people. And my representation in the US, like it's like barely anyone, not any, not anyone, like not anyone speaks the way I do or any of the people I speak. They don't speak like us. They don't support a ceasefire. If they do, it's very tame. And that's the next thing I want to get to here is, the Democratic Party is made up of people who are so pro-Israel, they're willing to fracture from their base. And when I say that they're willing to fracture from their, from their base, what I mean is that I've been watching for the past like couple of decades, specifically, I'd say like the last 10 to 15 years. If you look at polls over how the Democratic base feels about the issue of Israel-Palestine, you see increasingly they are more and more pro-Palestine and less and less pro-Israel. And then when you go by generation, you break it down by generation, it's even more. I mean, there was a recent Gallup poll. It was back in November. Uh, And this is, this is, there was a lot of destruction by November. There's even more destruction of Gaza now where there was a significant portion of democratic voters who disapprove of Biden's handling of the war. Um, And specifically the under 35 range, it was like 69% disapprove. And then when asked which side they sympathize with, Israelis or Palestinians, Democrats younger than 35 were more likely to sympathize with Palestinians, 74% of them, than Israelis, just 16% of them. And even when you go older, Democrats 65 and older were more likely to sympathize with Israelis, but it was still only 45 percent. And then 25 percent sympathized with Palestinians. And then I guess the rest were like not really going either way. The point is to say there is a huge generational divide on this issue. And then when you go down to like people of color, it's even more pro-Palestine. But the Democratic base, there's no question, is increasingly pro-Palestine, increasingly against Israel 
and this party, it's not reflected anywhere in this party. And I'm just curious your thoughts on that and what that means for this party moving forward. Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that the overwhelming majority of Americans would uh, join me in ra- wrapping myself in a kiffia and chanting uh, to, from the river to the sea. But an overwhelming majority, overwhelming majority of Democratic voters support a ceasefire. That is mm-hmm. just a bottom barrel basic demand at this point. That is, it's, I think it's being characterized as a, it's much more radical than it is. So a lot of us have been citing this, like, I think 66% overall figure of Americans who support a ceasefire. But it's worth noting that it's upward of 70%. I've seen um, polls showing it was as high as 80% of Democratic voters who are the people that Biden needs to turn out to win elections do support a ceasefire. And increasingly, people have been saying that this is their red line. So everybody knows that I was the person who attracted a lot of ire back in 2016 and 2020 um, for saying that I had my own litmus test and would not vote for Joe Biden at those times. And a lot of folks, including folks on the left, disagreed with me on that as those that are right. But I've seen a lot of those same people saying that what's happening in Gaza, watching a genocide unfold on TikTok is their red line. And I respect that whatever it took for folks to get to their red line, more and more people are realizing that the conduct of the current administration is not one they can endorse even with their votes. Um, and I saw a, uh, I think it was a CNN town, not a town hall, a, um, like a, like a voter panel, um, that was been going around the last couple of days going kind of viral in which one young woman was asked about what her kind of non-negotiables were and whether she was concerned about reproductive health. And she very articulately explained that, of course, uh, reproductive health is a priority for her, but that it would be hypocritical of her to vote for Joe Biden to protect her own reproductive health when there was a front page story today about uh, Palestinian women using scraps of tents and getting infections because they don't have menstrual products or women having their babies cut out of their stomach without anesthetic in these C-sections that have to take place without any working hospital infrastructure. And another gentleman on that panel um, who's a uh, Muslim American was saying that he and everybody he knows in his own community are not voting for Joe Biden. He specifically said, I used to make fun of single issue voters. I used to not respect single issue voters. I thought it was irresponsible. But now I'm in a place where, yes, I am a single issue voter and I absolutely will not be voting for for Joe Biden because of what he's doing uh, in Gaza. And I know many, many Arab Americans and Muslims Muslim Americans feel the exact same way, especially concerning for Democrats that so many are concentrated in a must win state like Michigan. Yeah, I mean, I can say like my my Arab family, I nobody is going to like they're they're like, I can't I can't even if he stops at this point, even if he stops this war tomorrow, they're like, no, he doesn't see us as human. He doesn't care about killing our children. Like this man is disgusting. They don't see a difference between him and Trump at this point. It's like like genocide is the worst case scenario. We're always told lesser evil because the worst case scenario What's worse than genocide? And I I obviously I recognize that Donald Trump poses, you know, a different kind of threat domestically in the US, especially with the movement that comes with him. But I completely understand. I I can't cast a vote for somebody who has repeatedly justified the mass murder of babies. Like I just can't. And you know, Joe Biden has been asked on more than one occasion, though this one was at least on video, like uh that, uh, you know, about like, oh, like, are you concerned about it all, at all about Arabs basically not voting for you because of what's happening in Gaza? And here's a clip of a recent uh, of a recent re- recently a reporter asking him that very question. And the audio is not so great, but I'm going to play it anyways. It's very short. Let's take a listen. Cardinals, are you concerning the Arab American vote voting for you during the election because of Gaza? Many say they will not vote for you. Well, look, uh, the president wants to put a, the former president wants to put a ban on Arabs coming into the country. So we make sure he, we understand who cares about the Arab population, number one. Number two, we got a long way to go in terms of settling the situation in Gaza. <laughs> So for uh, hopefully people who are just listening or even watching could hear, but I'll just re- reiterate what he just said there. So his his argument to this reporter asking him a lot of Arab Americans say they don't want to vote for you because of what's happening in Gaza. His argument is, yeah, but Donald Trump wants to deport Arabs. So like they need to think about who actually like uh, cares about them and who doesn't. So you're telling me my choices are somebody who is supporting a genocide against Arabs versus somebody who wants to deport him. What on earth kind of choice is that? It's, it's really remarkable. It's extremely <laughs> yeah. dark. Um, 
I saw other, some other people pointing out that it's a Muslim ban, not an Arab ban, and pointing out how many. Right. I think most American Muslims are not Arab and vice versa. I mean, they're both like they're overlapping, but obviously just most being, Arabs. So most Arab Americans are actually Christian. Yes, and not Muslim. Yes, and, yes, yes, yeah. So from both in so, both directions, the Venn diagram. He's like missing out on relevant populations here, or being overly <laughs> inclusive of some. But the the point the I mean the point stands that it's incredible to try to weaponize something like a Muslim ban against the 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 policies that you're enacting in the moment that you have complete control over, acting like it's a zero sum game. He's basically saying you have to allow me to act with impunity because look what the other guy is going to do. Rarely do we see such an explicit articulation of how pernicious vote blue no matter who is because the follow-up should be what does one have to do with the other? People are asking whether you, in your capacity as president of the United States right now today, who is fully funding and providing diplomatic cover for a genocide being conducted by a country that's described as one of our greatest allies, whether or not you are, have any plans to bring an end to it. Are you planning to earn people's respect and their votes by bringing it into one of the most horrific humanitarian disasters that any of us have ever watched unfold before our eyes in the modern era? Or are you simply going to fear monger and shake a stick and say, you, you better eat shit and like it? And that's exactly, I mean, this is, this is like a version of you ain't black, right? This is a version of something that Joe Biden has been saying to various demographics who have the uh, de demographic groups that have the audacity to stand up and say, why should I affirmatively vote for you? And I think that there's going to be a really tough wake up call for Joe Biden and the Democratic Party, because I have seen increasingly people who are usually very protective of Joe Biden and defensive of the Democratic Party and whatever they do, slowly start to or at least express some worry that this this particular kind of attitude that's been expressed by Biden is going to cause them to lose it. And it's going to be downstream effects. You know, you might be Gretchen Whitmer sitting there in Michigan thinking, golly, I'm, I'm really seeing what my constituents are saying, what all of my Arab American and Muslim American constituents are saying here in Michigan. And if, if I if I stand too close to Biden, is this going to come and bite me in the butt a little bit down the line? People are concerned and you can see some shifting attitudes. People like Adam Johnson have been doing a really good job covering how even the mainstream press is trying to um, create some preemptive insulation for when this I, I'm hesitant to say when this goes really bad, like turns bad, because it's already turned about as bad as many people can imagine. But they're already laying the foundation for, oh, Biden wanted caution. Oh, Biden tried to intercede. Oh, Biden tried to convince Netanyahu. Oh, friction between Biden and Netanyahu, as though he doesn't have the power to turn off aid and weaponry with a flip of a switch. It's it's truly incredible. And I'm also just kind of waiting for the moment when there's going to be those like white liberals who are going to be like, well, it's the fault of the Arabs. They didn't come out and vote for him and they got Trump elected again. And, and it's just like, no, like it's no, it's your fault. It's your fault. And it's it's every single time this happens, it's like, well, it's the fault of the left. It's the fault of Susan Sarandon. It's Brianna Joy Gray's fault. <laughs> oh, <Always>. it's all <laughs> yeah, it is. You know what, Brianna? I, I'll own it, Rania, because I got to say my frustration at times with the left has been if you want to th those arguments happen no matter what we do. Right. In 2016, more Bernie voters voted for, you know, switch, switch paths and cross uh, and voted for Hillary Clinton. Then Hillary Clinton voters in 2008 switched over and voted for Barack Obama when he was the eventual Democratic nominee, right? Historically, the left falls in line, whether or not I like it. Historically, the left falls in line. And yet they still get blamed for Trump or whoever else comes down the pike. So to me, the goal should be creating a foundation for making a more politically advantageous argument when and if the Democratic nominee ends up failing. So if you establish well in advance, years in advance, that here are our conditions to actually voting for the Democratic candidate, maybe the condition is to actually have a fair primary where there are debates that the Democratic, the, the, the DNC hosts, and that Biden participates in actually giving us an opportunity at a democratic election. Maybe one of the conditions is, um, you know, having a certain amount of e equality and coverage for the candidates that we would like to see entertained more seriously in the race because they share our own politics. If we, if maybe it's a specific policies that we want uh, Biden to engage in that he promised at one point when he was running four years ago that he has obviously reneged on. I don't know what it is, but the point of the matter is we need to be in a position, in my view, to say 
we gave you an out. We gave you an opportunity to earn our votes. We didn't ask for things that were unreasonable. We asked for things that are populist. We asked for things that are deliverable, things that can be delivered via executive order and the like, or that are fully in control of the Democratic Party. And you failed to do that. So to the extent that you lost, it is clearly not on us because you had every opportunity in the world to satisfy these very reasonable and broad demands. And I, I would hope that as part of that project, the broader public that buys into these mainstream narratives about how the left is a, is the problem child will start to ask themselves, well, is the left really the problem or is the Democratic Party really so committed to its neoliberal politics over actually winning and defeating fascism, in quotation marks, yeah. um, that it is willing to, it would rather lose than take even one small side shuffle to the left. And by the left, I mean the center where most people are. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly. Well, and I think that one thing that we're going to see instead of what you just described, um, I, 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 which is like the there should be this introspection and this recognition, but we don't see it in the mainstream. Uh, so those conversations that are having to happen naturally among people, if they do at all, or if they happen to stumble, stumble onto like your show or my show. Um, uh, but, you know, there is I think we got a little bit of a sneak peek of the kind of response we're going to see to people who refuse to vote for Biden. And that was with this recent interruption when Biden gave a speech at uh, Mother Emanuel AIM Church mm -hmm. in South Carolina, which was, of course, I believe this was on the anniversary of the shooting back in what was it, 2015? Tea. No, actually, I don't even remember what year yeah, it was. I don't know that it was. was it, I, I saw people saying it was on the anniversary, but was it actually? I, I said, oh, I'm actually not even sure. But maybe I was actually under Trump, so it couldn't have been 2015. I don't know why I'm suddenly throwing 2015 yeah, it was out, in out June. there. It, oh, no. Yeah, it was in June of 2015. Oh, it was 2015. So what's interesting about the fact that it was in June is the fact that people tried to run with the idea that this was an anniversary speech right. when he was just giving basically a campaign speech then, right. in that case. Right. So so he's at this, this he's at this black church speaking, and here's the video of the of of the protest. I'm just there's gonna no play light. it real quick. Without light, there's no path from this darkness. If you really care about the lives lost here, you should honor the lives lost in Culver Ceasefire in Palestine. Ceasefire! 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 That's all right. 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 Okay, so I mean, he basically and they end up being removed, and then he's like, "It's all right," as you can see. I mean, it was. I thought it was a perfectly fine disruption. I mean, ceasefire now, ceasefire now. And so, what was the response to that? Were comments like uh, this? by uh, Edward Isaac, is it Dovi Dovier? I'm not yeah, sure how I'm to pronounce sure. his name. Um, I think he's at the Atlantic, if I'm not mistaken, but so. he's like, he went into like crisis PR mode for the Democrats and mm -hmm. says ahead of Biden's arrival, anticipating that there might be protests, the pastor of Mother Emanuel specifically asked for people attending to show respect for the church by not interrupting. Both protesters who interrupted at the historic black church were white. <laughs> so now, so now, Brianna, the issue is not about genocide. It's not about whether it's appropriate to, to protest Biden. It's now they were white. They were white and they were interrupting black people. So actually, this protest against genocide in Gaza was in reality racist. Right. I mean, <laughs> so this is, the, make, make, this is the playbook. I mean, this is the exact playbook that basically started my journalism career because I was so frustrated in these kind of arguments being weaponized against Bernie back in 2016. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear the rest, you can access it by becoming a Breakthrough News member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news.